Hello, I'm uh, George Amato. I'm the director of the Sackler Institute for Comparative Genomics at the American Museum of Natural History here in New York. And you're here in one of our facilities. It's called the Ambrose Monell Cryo Collection for Molecular and Microbial Research, or sometimes just called the Frozen Tissue Collection. It's actually the largest repository of frozen biological samples representing the diversity of life on the planet anywhere in the world. Uh, we have samples here in this collection, over 100,000 accession specimens, and they include everything from microbes to actually samples from humpback whales. Uh, I want to show you a little bit today about how we store the samples here and tell you a little bit about the collection. Actually, every sample in this collection makes its way into a little cryo tube, just like this. Um, these tubes are specially designed to uh, withstand the uh, cold temperatures here um, in the, as, as they're frozen under liquid nitrogen. They actually have a barcode on them, which helps us obviously keep track of the samples, and we maintain a database with a lot of metadata on all of the information related to the sample. It includes where, what the sample is, where it was collected, and lots of other additional information. Um, all of the samples are uh, entered into a box that looks just like this. Make sure I put it on right. And so it has a unique barcode. It goes into a unique space with a number, into a unique box, a unique rack, and then into a unique vat. These vats really are something like a big thermos. Um, they're well insulated, and we keep them filled about to this level with liquid nitrogen. That ensures that our samples are, are kept frozen at 160 degrees, minus 160 degrees Celsius, which is the ideal temperature for storing these samples. The other great thing about this collection is that, unlike storing something in a freezer, um, and we would always say, with a freezer, it's not if, it's when it's going to break. Um, if we lose power here, this collection is completely safe without any attention for three months. So um, it's an ideal way. I used to say, but we'll never lose power in Manhattan, but you know, after Hurricane Sandy, I stopped giving that part of the talk. Um, I'd like to show you a little bit about how it's organized and open one of the vats. Um, so what I'm first going to do is just add a little uh, liquid nitrogen into the bottom to make sure we keep the pressure up. Uh, I will grab some, some gloves. You'll notice that these uh, vats have handles on the outside. That's kind of important. Um, if you put your hands inside, you become part of the collection. So. What's in here are metal racks. I'm going to pull one up. And, um, and it's where we slide in the sample boxes. little bit of humidity in here today, so a little harder to see. Here we go. Here are our frozen samples um, of all different kinds of species. And our very talented and dedicated staff here um, are able to locate any sample that we have of the 100,000, they can locate a sample within five minutes. I'm going to close this back up now. Um, a quick question from Julie Aloko. Um, she asks, what's in there? So like, what kind of samples do we have in the cryo collections? So the point of this collection is to really have a good representation of all of the diversity of life on our planet. In some, some of our samples are microbial, and so we have unique microbes that our scientists have found, and one of those sample tubes might have 
millions of those microbes. In some of those sample tubes are insects, mosquitoes, uh, beetles, and we can fit a whole animal in there. Um, I mentioned we also have uh, many, many samples from humpback whales uh, from a project that we did uh, on humpback whales in Madagascar. There we have a little biopsy of, of the whale that was taken with a biopsy dart, and those biopsies are in those samples. So we literally have tens of thousands of different species all represented in this collection. Another um, important uh, aspect of this, uh, of our frozen tissue collection is we are, we've been selected as, since we're an ideal repository for these kinds of samples, to be the special repository for many special collections. So for instance, about seven years ago, we signed a memorandum of understanding with the U.S. National Park Service. The U.S. National Park Service which owns all the biological samples that are collected by researchers in our parks, and they belong to all of us, to all the citizens of the United States, they didn't have an appropriate place to archive and store those samples and make them available for research. So they asked us to be the special repository for these uh, very special samples. Also from many other uh, researchers and many other important projects and programs, uh, scientists look to us to be able to um, store their samples and make them available for research. And not only are these samples useful for our own researchers here at the museum, in, for instance, in our Genomics Institute, but they are also uh, uh, very valuable to scientists literally all over the world. So our staff will receive requests, which we carefully evaluate, and then we send out uh, small aliquots of our samples to scientists throughout the United States and throughout the world for their research. Another really important aspect of a collection like this is the ability to do what I call retrospective studies. So we've actually been freezing things at the museum even before this uh, facility opened. And all of those, even from things that were frozen 50 years ago, have all been moved here. Um, but so, for instance, when people were interested in whether um, H5N1, avian influenza, was, whether it was a new emerging disease in birds or whether it had been circulating in the past, they could come back to our collection, look at wild bird samples from many years ago, and see was there evidence of that influenza virus back at that time. So there are many kinds of questions that can be asked because we maintain a long history of collection. Also, the museum is actively still collecting biological materials across the globe. With recent major expeditions to Papua New Guinea, the Solomon Islands, um, this past year uh, to a national park in Cuba with Cuban biologists, and all of materials representing all of those different ongoing uh, biological surveys make their way into this collection, again, uh, just increasing its value over time. Um, so we have another question from Mercedes Vasquez, who asks, how much time uh, do these specimens need to last? So how long are you planning for these to be in the collections? Well, the reason that we store them under these conditions is Theoretically, these samples are stable and would be useful in perpetuity. So under the, these conditions, under this frozen liquid nitrogen conditions, these samples would be useful and valuable literally for thousands of years. And uh, maybe in a similar question, um, Steve Faddis asks, how long can you work with a sample before the quality of the specimen is compromised? And I think he means, like, if you take it out for study, you know, would you be able to put it back in? Or, you know, what would happen there? For most of our uh, biological samples, it's, it's okay if we take them out, thaw it a bit, and, and to also um, take a, a small piece of it and then go ahead and refreeze it. We still will remain intact 
the DNA, the RNA, but also there are other things. There might be, um, uh, like, like in the blubber from the whale, we might look for uh, contaminations from pollutants or other kinds of chemicals. But in general, it's okay as long as we don't leave them out unattended for a long time. So they have great value. Also, we may, for a lot of our samples, we maintain many replicates of it so that we can send out material, have material uh, available for research, but still know that we have valuable samples still here. Um, I'll just reintroduce myself. Um, my name is George Amato. I'm the director of the Sackler Institute for Comparative Genomics at the American Museum of Natural History here in New York, and we're in our Ambrose Monell cryo collection for molecular and microbial research, a mouthful. Um, Matthew Sutton actually had a kind of funny question. Do you get a lot of questions about Jurassic Park and you know the scene in which they have like frozen tissues and things like that? Yes, we do. We get lots of those questions. And it's really quite interesting because, um, uh, of course, you know, the science fiction part of Jurassic Park has been discussed a lot, um, and, and the issues of trying to find any usable uh, bio, bio, biological samples at that, at that age is, you know, is so unlikely. But we can go back many thousands of years and still find usable DNA from more recently extinct species. And uh, especially with the new techniques in next generation sequencing, those materials are, we can now actually sequence from those materials. So that's how, for instance, we were able, uh, scientists were able to get the, the genome sequence from a Neanderthal, for instance, but they've done that from mammoths and mastodons and other kinds of creatures too. Um, a question from Bethann Unfettered asks, what's the oldest specimen that we have here? Ooh, the oldest specimen. Uh, I know that we have some specimens that are, um, we're, we're from our traditional collections. We isolated DNA. For instance, I'll give you an example from my own research. It's, I, I would have to check with our collections manager, who's the expert, to find out exactly what the oldest specimen is. But I'll give you an example of one. I was doing a study on dwarf crocodiles from Central Africa. Here at the museum, we have a type specimen of the dwarf crocodile. In other words, the one for which the species had been described based on that sample was about 100 years old. Um, I went to our traditional collection in herpetology, um, scraped some material off of the original skin. And we extracted DNA from that specimen and actually published on that. But that DNA is in this collection, so we certainly have DNA from specimens that are over 100 years old. Um, Steve Karafit asks, how are specimens prepared so that they're not damaged by the freezing process? So it, uh, actually, the, the way we collect the samples um, is uh, in the field is frequently, if you come over here, I can actually show you, we have uh, containers like, or like right here, a, sh a shipper, and in this shipper, there's um, a, a material that looks like styrofoam, but it's like a sponge, and it will actually soak up liquid nitrogen, but it, but it won't be liquid, it's sloshing around. And when we do that, this will stay cold at that temperature for about a month, and we can take that literally out into the field. So from soon as the specimen is collected, it can go right into that temperature. Um, and that's really important for things like extracting RNA. Um, because we're primarily collecting samples for, for DNA and RNA, that's not a problem. They don't have to be prepared specially. The more important part is that they're frozen as quickly as possible or else collected in a special buffer that ensures that the nucleic acids will remain intact until we get them into, um, into one of the freezers. Um, Maria Elena Nunez Fialos asks, uh, are these specimens only from the animal kingdom or do you also have plant species or bacteria or anything? Okay, so we actually have from across the whole tree of life. So bacteria, I mean, we have DNA and RNAs from, from viruses even. 
Um, we have a, a broadly across all of the animal kingdom, fungi. Uh, we don't have a huge collection of plant material, but we do have some. Um, our, our sister institution at the New York Botanical Garden, they uh, have taken the lead on collecting a lot of plant materials. But we, I mentioned we have 100,000 specimens, uh, but we have the capacity right now in this room for a million. And we're adding 10,000 or plus specimens every year. So if you have some good plant samples and you're a scientist and they're valuable, feel free to send them to us and we'll add them to our collection. Um, and this is maybe like the last question. Uh, Steve Faddis asks, if you were to get a sample of a critically endangered species, could this collection in the future act as like an arc where cloning of the species would be an option? So absolutely. I mean, the, um, we in fact have a lot of endangered uh, species DNA in our collection. Um, my own research, um, when I'm not being a science administrator, for the last 27 years has been doing molecular biology and now genomics on endangered species. Um, so we have a lot of that here in this collection. And we know that the specimens we're saving now, um, we're certain that we can't even predict what technologies will be available. I mean, the things that I do today are, would have been unimaginable to me even when I was a, a graduate student. And so, yes, I mean, I think, I think there's great value to saving those things. And it's not just the idea of bringing them back, but even for us to understand their place in the biological world and in communities if they disappear you know, due to human activity. Okay, well, thank you so much, George. This has been great. Okay, my pleasure.